So my name is Michal Wurschuk and I would like to invite you for a meeting uh, about the Arctic uh, from a slightly different perspective as probably most of the uh, teachers uh, usually uh, present this, this region. Uh, you were able to download the um, worksheet uh, related to this, with this meeting with my, with my presentation. Uh, so I hope that all of you can use it after the, the class to make sure that you well remember what I was talking about and check whether the information was uh, <coughs> available for you and you can uh, use it. Um, we also have a possibility to do a Slido poll during the lecture at the right, in the right moment. I will tell you about, about this and ask this, this question which will be connected with this. Uh, with this poll. So uh, let me start with a short introduction uh, to the topic, uh, to the question, here I am. So in my presentation, in my uh, talk to you today, I would like to focus on uh, a few most important issues from my perspective. So I would like to start with presentation, what international relations uh, as a discipline, what is it and uh, what can you expect when you are international relations researcher or even a person who is interested in this kind of, of uh, uh, issues or problems at all. Uh, now, uh, after this, I would like to tell you about uh, who is owning the changing Arctic, who, is, uh, who has rights to do anything in the region from political perspective. Then I would like to uh, show you some information how states are engaged in cooperation in the Arctic. In my opinion, cooperation is the most important element of the uh, relations between states and non-states in the region. So I would like to, to share with my with this view with you. And I would like to conclude also to say a few words about challenges, because even if the Arctic is dominated by the cooperation, uh, we cannot uh, say that there are no any challenges, any problems uh, connected with uh, this kind of, of cooperation. So uh, we also should take a look on, on, on them. All right, so uh, let me present you my discipline, my fields of, of interest and, and my work actually. So what is international relations? What is it about? Uh, first, we should uh, notice that there are different opinions about, uh, about the status of the discipline. Uh, for some people, uh, international relations studies can be perceived as uh, just one of fields of political sciences, which is very broad uh, social science. Uh, what is very important to, take in, to have in mind is the fact that this field is interdisciplinary. So when you are doing international relations, uh, you are probably interested in different things connected with international transborder relations. It can be economics, it can be the sociology, it can be culture. Uh, different aspects can be included in this in this field. Uh, the other perspective, which is associated with international relations studies, uh, suggests that it's entirely independent academic discipline. So this is something uh, similar to political science, but political science is oriented towards what is happening in the state. Uh, while uh, international relations are studying relations among states, relations among different types of, of, of actors. So it uh, doesn't matter actually which, which perspective you are taking, uh, you are accepting. Uh, the most important field, uh, thing is that this field has their own separate uh, area of interest, which is associated mainly what is happening in the international uh, system. In the, in the global scale even. Uh, so uh, this is the, the thing which I would like to stress and say a few words more. What actually international relations studies uh, try to find out what they want to discover. So first of all, we should start with the fact that they try to uh, examine on to discover, uh, to research different types of political entities, different types of uh, actors, we can even say, uh, you usually quite often say in international relations about actors. So we have here sovereign states, just like, for example, in my case, it would be Poland, it can be Russia, and then the United States, Germany, 
we have now more or less about almost 200 sovereign states in the world. Uh, of course, there are different criteria to say who is a sovereign state, so which state is sovereign. Uh, but uh, we don't have to, 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 to focus on this very much now. The other type of actors which is important for our studies in are uh, intergovernmental organizations, uh, such as United Nations organization, for example. To some extent, it is also European Union. Uh, we can find many different uh, associations of states which form organizations. It can be World Meteorological Organization, even. Uh, we also have international non-governmental organizations, so organizations which are set up because of a need of cooperation, but not be between or among governments, but different other different types of, of institutions in countries. For example, in, for example, in case of uh, Arctic, you can take as an example International Arctic Science Committee, IASC, which is a very important organization supporting development of research in the, in the region. Uh, we can also have uh, multinational corporations as the important actors in the international relations, uh, like, for example, Google, or uh, we can take Ford or other companies which have very important uh, role in the relations between states, uh, mostly because of uh, the economic power. It is, it is uh, the reason why they are included in the, in the scope of the studies. Uh, so this is the most classical, I would say, approach to, to study uh, different entities which are engaged in international relations. Uh, we also, uh, as international relations researchers, try to uh, evaluate, to assess, to examine uh, different institutions, regimes, which are produced by these interactions. So we take actors, we take a look what they are doing, and we try to explain, assess, and, and even to some extent predict what can what these relations can be in the future, how they will uh, develop in, in, in coming years. Uh, this kind of, of, of approach is, is quite uh, important because uh, as you can uh, see, we can be as researchers uh, in two roles to some extent because we are academics, so we are doing research, we are trying young people. But at the same time, we can, to some extent, try to contribute to foreign policy-making processes. And some of us can uh, serve as advisors, for example, to the government or to regional governments or local governments, uh, helping to solve different uh, issues, different problems, which are associated with uh, international uh, cooperation. So this is very, very good thing, I would say, because we are not only focus on theoretical aspects of, of our research, but also try to, to bring our knowledge to, to some practice. And uh, there is even one more um, opportunity for researchers to be engaged in this, this kind of processes. Because sometimes researchers, and not only these from international relations field, can become uh, how we call them informal diplomats. So they can be to some extent used as a tool of cooperation between states. In this case, we are talking about science diplomacy, which is very informal way how states communicate to each other, how they, how they uh, try to resolve problems or do some progress in their relations. So this kind of science diplomacy is nowadays very, very uh, growing. Uh, field of interest and its importance is also growing and I I'm deeply convinced that the Arctic is a very good example of this what is happening in this in this case all right so now as you know what is relation uh, uh, studies about I would like to move to our main topic which is uh, Arctic so let's start with uh, trying to answer the question of who is owning the changing Arctic who 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 can say that the Arctic belongs to to, to him or to her. Uh, the issue is having growing importance in last uh, years because of the climate change uh, consequences and some possibilities for a growing uh, new engagement of, of, of societies in the North. So actually we can think about this topic from different perspectives. For example, we can try to answer that the people who are living in the Arctic, they are owner of the Arctic. Uh, since thousands of years, indigenous Arctic peoples were the primary owners and users of the of the of the high north uh, of the Arctic. Uh, so, 
to some extent we could associate the presence and, and the rights to the land, to the water, to the nature as, a, as a something obvious or primary. However, international relations from state perspective, uh, state perspective um, mostly uh, focus on state. So indigenous peoples are not so strong actors in these relations and their positions to some extent, unfortunately, is not, not equal to two states. And they are in, their influence on international relations is not very, very strong, actually. So we can also take a look uh, from different perspective on this, on this topic. Uh, for example, uh, for example, who, who discovered the Arctic? Maybe people who discovered the Arctic uh, could say that they own the Arctic because in old times it was uh, said that people who are discovering some parts of territory are becoming the owner of this territory. So this perspective is truly uh, very European centric or Western centric because uh, most of the discoveries in the Arctic, which were called parts of unknown of the Arctic, as you can see on this map, which was created in the beginning of 18th century, uh, most of the discoverers uh, were coming from European states and then after from uh, British uh, colonies like Canada or United States. So discovering the, the Arctic was was done mostly by uh, Western European. In case of Russia, of course, we have this uh, discoveries since uh, 15th, 17th, 16th century, uh, which were uh, conducted by, by Russian and especially by Russian Cossacks, which were trying to, 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 to move to the, to the far, uh, towards the far east. Uh, there is also another opportunity to think about. It's a more modern, more temporary, contemporary approach, which is focused on states. On this map, you can see the states uh, which possess territories in the Arctic. In this case, in political sciences, in international relations, we are usually uh, thinking about Arctic from political perspective, uh, using Arctic Circle as a, as a, as a borderline. So all states uh, who possess uh, which possess uh, territories up to the north from the Arctic Circle are described as a Arctic Arctic states. Uh, they include even Finland and Sweden and Iceland. Even although although the states, the states are not having access to the Arctic oceans, so nowadays we are talking we are saying that the Arctic belongs to uh, eight Arctic states. So it is very good to to, to remember about uh, about this. Uh, um, Think. Uh, next issue I would like to um, say is that uh, the Arctic, as a as a, as a place of interest of international relations uh, scientists, uh, we should perceive it in in a, in a dynamic way. Uh, the significance of the of the region was changing uh, during the centuries. So you can see on the on the graph. Uh, we can distinguish uh, four periods of, of or stages in this development. We can start with colonial period, uh, when it was more or less uh, uh, times of discoveries, and so private companies, travelers, and explorers were very active in the in the, in the region. Uh, they were focused on exploration, exploitation of natural resources. So from International relations perspective, it was nothing, nothing uh, important happening in the in the in the region. The situation has changed in the 20th century, especially during the uh, Second World War and during the Cold War, because uh, the strategic importance of the Arctic was discovered. So states, uh, actually, predominantly, Arctic states uh, became more and more interested in the in the region because of the strategic, military, and security interests. And then balance of power became uh, some kind of, of, of driving force in relations between states. After the end of the Cold War, which was in the beginning of the 90s, uh, we have a very good moment for the Arctic because we are trying to, uh, to some extent, create or build this region from scratch. So we have involved uh, states and regions, indigenous peoples, non-governmental organizations and researchers trying to cooperate together to make this region uh, something uh, consistent, something as a, as a one uh, huge uh, community to some extent. 
So there are different different uh, solutions, different uh, types of cooperations. They can be described as a network of regional regimes. Uh, this period has lasted, uh, according to me, for 15 years, more or less, because in the beginning of 21st century, the situation has changed. We have now different international relations and we have climate change developments or consequences. So the Arctic has became more global even uh, thing, I would say. The situation can be described or can be explained uh, on the next slide, which is showing more the most important driving forces uh, and processes happening nowadays in the Arctic. So we have processes which compose modernization, saying generally, uh, which is based on development of technology advances. Uh, it is also, also associated with demographic changes taking place in the, in the region. Uh, the second big process is globalization. Uh, Arctic is truly becoming a global region, not only because it's lying on the top of the world uh, where different interests can, can uh, be linked, but because uh, the importance of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the Arctic is, is spreading around the whole globe. So we have a search of worldwide interests and, and, and links. And new actors coming from the south are more and more present in the, in the Arctic. And the last but not least is climate change as a maybe not social or not only social problem, uh, but it also has its importance in, in international relations. I don't want to say it only because of Paris Agreement and problems with implementation of this agreement, but a lot of, of consequences of climate change are just important for the Arctic states and non-Arctic states uh, because of economic and social consequences of, of these processes. Uh, I think that this systematic approach to, to the Arctic showing that all uh, systems, natural systems and social systems are linked, are connected, is a very good approach because it shows the importance of the changes taking place in the, in the region. All right, so it was just to give you some introduction about the Arctic, about the actors, about the problems which are taking place there. Now let's move to the next issue, so how states cooperate in the Arctic. Uh, the most important uh, actor in this respect was created during this uh, second, third phase of development, which was initiated after the Cold War, uh, which is associated with uh, beginning of cooperation, of close cooperation between the states in the Arctic. This cooperation developed in 1996 into Arctic Council, structures, which is an uh, intergovernmental organization or form for intergovernmental uh, cooperation. As you can see on this, on, this, on this graph, there is a very specific structure of this, of this body, and I would like to pay your attention for a while about uh, on, on this issue. So what is, what, is, what is interesting in the Arctic and in the Arctic Council, and why we can say that the Arctic is a laboratory of international relations, it's exactly in the, in the, in the structure of, the, of this in institution. So first of all, we can see that not only states are engaged, we have also non-state actors, which are permanent participants, which are indigenous people's organizations involved in, the, in this cooperation. Uh, according to the rules which were accepted by all states in creating Arctic Council, there is a place for representatives of, of indigenous peoples we call them permanent participants of the Arctic Council. As you can see on the slide, there are six different uh, organizations engaged in the Arctic Council. Uh, they are coming from different parts of the Arctic. So we can say that actually uh, all Arctic is covered by their, their presence and their, their activity. Um, the, there are two rules uh, showing which organization can be engaged. So as you can see on the slide, it, is a, it must be a single indigenous people residence and more than in one Arctic state engaged in this case, or more than one Arctic indigenous people's residence in a single Arctic state. So we have two options. So it's connected with the, the, the presence of the indigenous peoples in one state or in more states or presence of more or uh, one more, more than one indigenous uh, people groups in the in the in the state. Uh, that presence is very important because it is not only legitimate, legitimate, it's 
offer not only legitimization for these states, but uh, it's important voice uh, from people who know Arctic the best, I would say, because of the thousands of years of living in the, in the region. So it is very, very crucial to have them at the table and, and listen to their voices, to listen to their knowledge, to know their knowledge, indigenous knowledge. Uh, because uh, based on this decision uh, which are taken, which are done during the Arctic Council Forum are just better decisions. So it's, it's a very good, uh, good idea to have them. And actually there are not too many other uh, international organizations sharing the table with indigenous peoples. So this is the reason why the Arctic is, is exceptional. As you can see on the slide, the indigenous people are very proud of their roots and they are uh, trying to uphold the traditional way of living and they are really offering unique knowledge to, 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 to the experts in the Arctic, especially researchers. So it is said nowadays that combining two knowledge, scientific knowledge and knowledge and indigenous knowledge is a very good way to, to, to move uh, forward with solving problems in the, in the region. All right. Uh, next uh, thing, which is uh, which is very important, is that in the Arctic Council, Arctic, Arctic Council, we have also non-Arctic actors. We call them usually observers, and the presence of observers maybe is not so unique, but the, the importance is is growing uh, in the last in the last years. Why? Uh, we are told that observer status in the Arctic Council is open to non-Arctic states, intergovernmental organizations or non-governmental organizations, everyone actually who is interested in, in, in the Arctic and is, 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 is trying to bring some asset to, to the development of the region. So it's a, to some extent the system is open, uh, the Arctic system is open for actors from in other parts of, of the world. Uh, as you can see on the uh, on the on the on the um, on the map, there are different types of, of actors involved, and I would like you now to take go to the Slido and and uh, name most of the important states which are non-Arctic states, uh, but are engaged in the in the Arctic. So take a look and now try to to do the Slido. All right, as I can see on, on the results of the polls, uh, most of the answers are associated with the Arctic states. So this is not exactly the, 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 the group of the people that, of the states we are talking about. So let's take a look again. Okay, thank you for showing the, the results. So here is the map and here is the list. And what is important, take a look on the date when uh, different states start to be engaged in the in the Arctic. So some of them, like Germany, uh, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, uh, United Kingdom, they started in the in the 90s. Actually, they were present at the table in the beginning of 90s, before even the Arctic Council was created. The last newcomers are coming from India, Korea, Sing Singapore, or Japan, China or even Italy. So there is a very broad uh, uh, list of, 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 of this non-Arctic states which have been approved as observers. Uh, we also have um, different uh, non-governmental organizations engaged in this, in this cooperation, but I will not tell about them because their position and their role is slightly different from, from states, of course. <clears throat> I would like to uh, mention that uh, actors, non-Arctic actors in the Arctic Council uh, are trying to be really engaged in this, in this uh, institution, in this cooperation, and they sometimes invent even new forms of cooperation. A uh, very good example, actually, in this case, is Poland, because the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Poland has created a few years ago a new forum of discussion, which was called Warsaw Format Meeting, uh, which are organized in Warsaw every second year where all the observers are sending their representatives to talk about how to be more engaged in the Arctic Council. So this is something uh, happening not in the Arctic, but outside, but it's uh, very much focused on the strengthening of the Arctic Council from non-Arctic states perspective. All right. And the last uh, important issue here when we are talking about the cooperation in the Arctic is science diplomacy. And uh, as you can see, the arrow is indicated the lowest 
place in this structure, which is associated with uh, working groups of the Arctic Council. Uh, actually, Council is operating on this in the six working groups, uh, which are composed from experts, government agencies, and researchers. Uh, you can see the logo of this of these different uh, structures, and I encourage you to to check on the websites of the, of the institutions uh, uh, of this working group later uh, what they are dealing with. Uh, on the slide, you can also have uh, some uh, pictures showing uh, reports which are uh, created by the uh, experts and researchers working in these groups. These documents are very important because they are guidelines for decision makers, for policy makers, how to deal with uh, the most important issues taking place in the Arctic nowadays. So how to organize, for example, shipping in the Arctic, how to protect an environment, uh, how to take care about the Arctic people. Uh, so th these kinds of activities are really very, very important. And I can truly say that the science diplomacy, so the connection between science and, and policy, international relations, are taking place in this, in this, in this area. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, so I would like to just briefly say a few words about challenges uh, in the Arctic from international relations perspectives. I have, chose, I have chosen three things which I think are the most important for us. Uh, first of them are territorial issues. Uh, it is quite often said in the media, mass media, that we should expect some kind of war in the Arctic because uh, there is growing military uh, operations in the Arctic, states are preparing for a war. I think this is not very true. As you can see on the map, which is, seems very complicated, uh, but this map is showing uh, legal uh, possibilities for states to extend their sovereign rights, how they can use different parts of the Arctic. So according to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, Arctic states can really have a huge impact on the huge parts of the Arctic. We cannot say that the Arctic belongs to nobody. As you can see on the map, it belongs to the Arctic, especially the Arctic Ocean coastal states. So from this perspective, uh, all states are truly legitimate to, to do different things of activities in the, in the regions. If the climate change will develop in, in the future, uh, as we expect, the scope of these activities will be growing. However, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, fight or we will have any territorial fights uh, in the Arctic because states know, know, um, states know their rights and uh, there are special tools to solve problems. For example, a few years ago, Norway, Norway and Russia dissolved uh, very long disputes about the maritime border on Barents Sea. And it was done in a very peaceful way through negotiation process. So I expect that this kind of solutions will be uh, used in future uh, very, very often when it's needed. But actually, there are not too many things in which states can disagree. Uh, I mentioned about this tool. Uh, let me say a few words more. So this, uh, there is a special commission on the limits of the continental shelf, uh, which is associated with United Nations organization. And uh, this uh, body is uh, examining uh, application from the Arctic states uh, when they are trying to uh, extend the continental shelf to have more access to the resources which are hidden in the uh, shelf of the Arctic Ocean. But actually, uh, to be honest, uh, our estimations show that already most, most of, the, of the resources are in the parts of the, of the shelf or parts of the economic zones of the states. So actually, there, are no, there is no huge need to, to, to develop the, the extent of, of continental shelf in the future because most of the resources are already covered by, by states. Uh, another challenges which are ahead of us are associated with ecological conflicts. I call them ecological conflicts because these conflicts can be based uh, on uh, ecological reasons to some extent. A few years ago, we had very, uh, I would say, tragic to some extent confrontation between the Greenpeace and, and the Russian Federation uh, services uh, about uh, would say illegal form of protests of, uh, of a Greenpeace in the Russian waters. However, uh, it is said that the first fires uh, were shot in the, in, the, in the Arctic because of this confrontation between non-governmental organization and state. So this kind of, 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 of fight between different types of actors, uh, let's hope not. 
but they may develop in in, in future when uh, some interest of, of, of different uh, actors will be engaged and, and the possibility of dialogue and so peaceful solution will be limited it is also true that states are preparing uh, or developing their military capabilities in the in the in the arctic uh, to some extent because uh, the armies uh, are very well prepared to operate in the in the in the north so this is that uh, states are developing this kind of capabilities. But uh, of course, we can also think about other uh, threats, no, not naturally military threats, which can be dangerous for states and people living in the Arctic. And in this case, uh, military, militaries can, can, can also assist or help people living in the Arctic. And the last but not least the challenge is maritime security. If we expect development of navigation in the um, Arctic Ocean in decades to come, uh, just on like on the picture, you can see LNG uh, tanker. We have uh, tourists, uh, big ships operating in the near the Greenland or Iceland. Uh, there is a growing uh, need to prepare for this kind of, of, of development uh, and growing of the shipping in the shipment in the in the in the in the Arctic. So search and rescue, for example, uh, capabilities are nowadays very crucial because if there are more people coming to the Arctic, the risk of a bad accident is growing. So we should also have some tools, have some capabilities to prevent, to, to protect people and prevent this kind of, 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 of situations. So maritime security definitely will be one of the, of the fields, and already it is uh, one of the fields of, of uh, cooperation between states also in the Arctic. Uh, in the Arctic Council. So to summarize my presentation, I would just to say and to leave you with one message that there are plenty of fascinating processes taking place in the Arctic from international relations perspective. Uh, Arctic can be very interesting play for social scientists. And I hope that uh, this talk showed you that uh, you can also do some research in this, in this direction. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any question now or later, please just let me know, contact with me in writing email. So it will be my pleasure to, to answer. Thank you very much.